What a powerful name, the name of Jesus. Well, church, we're into the second week in our mini-series titled Halftime. The idea of a halftime is based on what happens typically in sports. Typically, the halftime is aimed at offering insights, ideas uh, to the team in order to bring out the best performance in them. A halftime talk can help the team in strategizing to bring about a fresh focus as they go on to finish the game. So if you follow South African football, you would know that last weekend we witnessed one of the greatest upsets in the era of the Premier Soccer League in recent years. Kaiser Chiefs had been on top of the lock standings for well over 13 months. And on the last day of the league, they failed to win. The only thing that Kaiser Chiefs had to do on the day, this is last week Saturday, the only thing that they had to do was just to win. Win the game and they would finish on top. So the other team that was vying for the title was Mamelodi Sundowns. These guys were keeping their eyes on the title, but Kaiser Chiefs were on the lead for a very long time. This season, the soccer season was really entertaining. So, I mean, if you, if you, were to, if you watched that game, you'd know that Kaiser Chiefs went into the halftime on the lead. So all that they really needed to do was just for the remain, remaining 45 minutes just to continue winning, just to score more goals or to defend the lead that they had. So you can just imagine the type of halftime engagement that the, the, the Kaiser Chiefs uh, bench and team had uh, during their halftime. All that probably they were just saying was, guys, we are 45 minutes away from glory. Mamelodi Sundowns as well on the other match, they were on the lead. And all that they probably would have had to do was just to score a whole lot of goals because they were going to finish on equal points with Chiefs it's if both teams had won. But the goal difference was separating them. So maybe their conversation at halftime was, man, we've just, we have to keep on scoring goals. Well, we know how the story ended. We know it was painful for Kaiser Chiefs to have led that long and not win. Well, church, our goals in bringing these halftime talks are aimed at bringing us back to focus, to bring a sense of encouragement to you and to remind us, to remind ourselves of the game plan that Christ has given us. So last week, Pastor Dave took us through this beautiful psalm, Psalm 84, and he reminded us, he encouraged us to dwell in the courts of the Lord, to yearn for the Lord. So today I want us to pick up from that theme, the theme of being with Jesus, the theme of being with the Lord, to our doing, to our doing. And our theme for today I really want to just tackle this theme, that we are a saved people. So we are a people called to be with the Lord, yearning for the Lord. But not only that, we are also a sent people. So we are a saved people and a sent people. Well, the man who discipled me for many years, Pete Ketterman, used to make us, amongst just our discipleship group, he used to make us write in one or two or three sentences an epitaph. Now, well, 13 years ago, I didn't know what an epitaph was, but an, epi an epitaph refers to the text that is inscribed on tombstones. I know that sounds a little bit morbid, but actually, this was one of the greatest exercises that we were given in our discipleship experience. This really forced us to think deeply about the legacy that we want to leave behind. So I wonder if you were given that very assignment today, what you'd put on your epitaph. I am pretty sure that you'll, you'll put in so many things, well beyond even the three sentences, you'd put a whole lot of things because there's just so much that you'd want people to remember you about. You'd want to give people a lot about yourself in those final words. So this makes parting words a very important thing. Parting words 
are vital. They are so important. Today I want us to look at Jesus' parting words to his disciples. These parting words were not said by a dying man, but they were said by our, they were said by our resurrected Savior. And this is just before Jesus went back to be with the Father. So I want us to turn to a very popular passage, a very famous passage. I'm sure you've even memorized it by now. It is Matthew 28. We're going to read verses 18 through to verse 20. And this is what it says. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So this, this some have argued, some scholars have argued that this was the culmination or the culminating point of Jesus' ministry. This is what Jesus was about. He had come to seek and save the lost. And this commission, it was part of his plan that he would have modeled something for his disciples and he was to send them out. So the Lord gives this final charge to his disciples. And this, this passage contains very important teaching about Jesus' purpose for his disciples. And the word disciple, just to, to, just to define it for us, it means a follower of Jesus. So somebody who is following Jesus, a person who is being changed by Jesus and is committed to the mission of Jesus. This is a great definition given by Bobby Harrington. And I just love it so much because it captures everything that a disciple of Christ should be doing. So it is somebody who is actively following Jesus. He's a person who is being changed, who is being transformed into the likeness of Jesus. It is also a person who is committed to the mission that Jesus gives. So these men, these disciples had been in discipleship with Jesus. They had been with the Lord for a number of years. And I want to again just decide, define what I mean by discipleship. This is the process through which Jesus turns us into people who trust and follow him. So these men, these disciples had been with Jesus for a number of years. And they would have seen Jesus do a number of things in those three years. So this Great Commission will help us today to answer five questions that are so critical as we bring focus in this halftime talk. So we have this halftime moment to bring focus because we are saved and ascend people. And just some of these points, I just want to give credit to J Life. I've just recently completed training with J Life, I think about a month ago, and I was just blessed by some of their teaching. And so some of these things I picked up from the material that I went through. But yeah, so let us answer these five questions that this Great Commission helps us in bringing focus, in bringing focus as disciples of Christ. So the question, the first question that I want us to look at is, what is our purpose or what is the mission that followers of Jesus should be engaged in? So what is our purpose or mission as followers of Christ? Verse 19 says, therefore go and make disciples. So the disciples of Christ are given a clear mission that must be carried out. Jesus presented this challenge out of having discipled these men for over an ex extended period of time. They were to go and emulate him. They were to go and make disciples. So what is the mission that followers of Christ should be engaged in? It is making disciples. It is a very clear, clear, clear mission that his disciples had to do. So this is what the disciples would have seen Jesus do. They would have seen Jesus teach. They would have seen Jesus teach people about the kingdom of God. 
They would have seen Jesus correct them. They would have seen Jesus bring a fresh perspective into what it means to be a follower of God. They would have seen Jesus live out kingdom principles. They would have seen Jesus act counterculturally. They would have seen Jesus love kids. They would have seen Jesus value women. They would have seen a whole lot of things. They would have seen Jesus engaging with the people that were considered to be sinners, people that were considered to be outcasts. They would have seen Jesus go and say, I have come to seek out those that are lost because they are the ones that need me. So, fulfilling this command, make disciples, begins with being a disciple yourself. It begins with you as a follower of Christ, to follow Christ. I've heard it uh, being said that you cannot give what you do not have. And man, like I've, I've been discipling guys. I've had the privilege to disciple guys for over 13 years now. And what I have seen is oftentimes I would give my disciples maybe say they are struggling to be meeting or spending time with God. And I would say, guys, we've got to be spending time with the Lord. And in fact, sometimes in those times, I would be struggling too. So in that moment, I would be challenged to go back to the courts of the Lord myself, to go back and be a disciple myself. Because you cannot give what you do not have. So the disciples had to go out and make disciples because they had been discipled. They had been discipled by the master himself. The second thing that I want us to answer, it is how are we to fulfill the command of making disciples? So how are we, gonna, how are we going to fulfill this? So verse 19 says, go. So let me just read it for us. It says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So that's verse 18. And then verse 19 starts, it says, So therefore go and make disciples. So to state this go correctly, correctly to the language that these scriptures were written in, it is, as you are going, make disciples. So in the English, it might throw us off a little bit and, makes, and make it seem like the go is a command on its own. But the original text will show that as we go, so as we go, we are to make disciples. So what does that mean? So this then emphasizes intentionality. Intentionality in our everyday lifestyle to think about making disciples. So wherever we go, we are to make disciples of Christ. And this is where we work, where we study, where we play, and where we live, we are called to go and make disciples. So while going, we are to make disciples. The second thing, verse 19, the second part of verse 19 says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Well, this is purely just leading people publicly to declare what Christ has done on the inside for them. And it's a beautiful thing that we get to experience as a church. I miss our gatherings and I miss hearing stories of how people have come to faith and for people to get up there and share their testimonies before going through the waters of baptism. So Christ says, as we go, we must make disciples and we must identify, bring people to identify with him, with the cause of Christ. And then the third thing he says, teaching them to obey, in verse 20, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. So this, this teaching them to obey emphasizes not just teaching for knowledge. It is not just pushing information through to people, but it is teaching people to obey. It is teaching people to obey everything that Jesus commanded them to do. So there's a, massive, there's a massive difference between teaching and teaching people to obey. This speaks into shepherding. It is shepherding a person's heart to obey and follow Christ. 
It is a hard thing to do. I have kids. It's easy for my wife and I to give our kids commands, to tell them, go and do a certain thing. But it's quite another thing to shepherd their heart so that they do what we've commanded them to do. So Christ says here, we are to teach. Teach these disciples to obey, to obey everything that he has commanded. So this speaks into developing character. It is helping people understand that at their very core, at their very core, they are sinful beings. They are inclined to not obey. But in our disciple making, in making disciples, we are to teach them to obey. We are to challenge their hearts. We are to probe their hearts so that they obey. We are to challenge their priorities. We are to build their character. So that is teaching to obey. And the third thing that I want us to look at is, then what is our mandate? So in making disciples, what is the scope of it? What is the mandate that Christ gives? And it's, it comes out very clear. Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. So we are to make disciples from all, from all nations, all different ethnicities. And if, I'm, if, if my stats are correct, there are about 6,000 people groups that have not heard the gospel yet. They've never heard the name Jesus, that wonderful name of Jesus. They've never heard it. So we are to go and make disciples of all nations. And that is the heart of God. And I really want us to, if you read Revelations and just eavesdrop into eternity, you'll see this beautiful picture of multitudes of people from every tongue, from every tribe, from all nations, worshiping the Lord, worshiping the Lamb that was slain. So we get this picture, this complete picture of the heart of God, all nations have to be discipled. So we are to make disciples of all nations. In Acts 1.8, the Lord says, when the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive power to do what? To bear witness from where you were. So they were in Jerusalem. The disciples were in Jerusalem to Judea, the province, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So they were to spread the gospel. They were to make disciples to all nations, to the ends of the earth. So fulfilling this mandate, it starts right where you are, in your immediate environment, then moves beyond. So our mandate is to make disciples of all nations. It means people that don't look like us, Granted, we will share the gospel with people that look like us, right? But the gospel message, it is not given for a particular nation. There isn't a chosen nation, as it were. But it is for all nations. That through them, through the Jews that received the gospel, they were to be a blessing to the ends of the earth. That is the heart of, of God. This is what Christ commissions his disciples to do, to go and make disciples of all nations. Now, number four, what then are our means that are available for us to fulfill this commission, this mandate of making disciples of all nations? What are our means? And that's number four. I want us to answer this, and I want us to look very closely to verse 20. We fulfill this mission because Christ has promised us his presence. So just take a look here. In verse 20 it says, And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and get this, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the earth. Sorry, to the very end of the age. Right? So we are to fulfill this mission because Christ has promised us his presence. He has promised us 
the Holy Spirit. Just a, a few chapters before this, he would have told his disciples that it is better for him to go and be with the Father. But while he's away, he's going to send the helper. He's going to send the Holy Spirit to help the disciples. And in Acts 1.8, it becomes very clear. He crystallizes it and says, And you will bear witness. You will have boldness to bear witness about me. So we fulfill this great commission because Christ has promised us presence, not for a short span of time, but until the very end of the age. His presence is with us as we go. So the first, the first thing that we need to note about the, these verses that we're looking at, it is that we are commanded to make disciples. In fact, there are two commands here. The second command is just what we just spoke about. So that verse 20, beholding that Jesus is with us, that is a command for us as people that are, that, that are to go. It is a command to call to mind, to take note, to discern, to recognize that Jesus is with us. So we're given the first command, make disciples. The second command, it is beholding that he is with us, that the Holy Spirit is with us. What a promise. What a glorious promise this is in fulfilling such a difficult task, in teaching people to obey. Christ promises us. He promises us his presence. He's going to be with us as we go. So I just want to illustrate this a little bit. I spent some number of years at Wits University working there with Campus Outreach and sharing the gospel. And every time I'd go to campus, so I'd just drive into East Campus and park near Men's Res. And there in my car, I'd say a prayer before I go into the rooms or before I go wherever. I'd say a prayer, just, Lord, please show up. But I remember a few years back, I think it was around 2016, I had gone to campus and just on that day, I felt prompted to pray, particularly on that day, to be given the opportunity to share the gospel with somebody. So I got to campus and I prayed, not knowing what was to happen later. Got to campus and I prayed. And that evening, there was um, a comedy show that was going to take place at the Great Hall. So I took one of the guys that I was discipling at the time to go to this comedy show just for great laughs. But the prayer that I had prayed in the car was that, Lord, would you give me an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody? So we, off we went, we got into the Great Hall, packed Great Hall, and there was just a space in the middle section of the hall. So we went down and, and got in. So we set uh, the space. We said there was a guy sitting here and there was open spaces just to, the, to his sides. So we, say, we sat on either side. And I introduced myself to this guy and just started talking to him. Just started getting to know him together with my friend who was with me. And church, there the Lord showed me this promise that he is with me. He allowed me to share boldly about my faith. There was something happening on stage and this guy just turned and asked me some couple of questions. And I was able to witness about Christ. He didn't ask me about a gospel thing, but that conversation was turned into gospel, into gospel proclamation. And so later that evening, I found out that the guy uh, stayed uh, in Hillbro and the buses had left, so I offered to take him home. And I drove with him and just began to build a relationship with him. And I've just been so excited to see this young man grow in the Lord. He grew, he gave his life to Christ during our interaction uh, over many Bible studies. But what I tend to see now about his life is that he's giving that away. He's sharing the gospel to others and he's leading other guys at Wits in the Lord. So here's this promise that we ought to cling on to as we go, as we make disciples. Our means is the promised Holy Spirit, his presence, 
his empowering as we go. And the fifth thing that I want us to look at, or the fifth question that I want us to answer, it is what should compel us to go and make disciples? So what should compel you and I? We're having this halftime talk, church. We are re-strategizing, we're looking at our game plan. But what should compel us to go and make disciples? Just before I get to that, this Great Commission, it is popular. We're all familiar with it. But it is one of the list obeys, list obeyed, you know, commands of Christ. Not a lot of people are making disciples. So what should compel us to make disciples, to go and make disciples? Number one, I want us to look at the fact that we are commanded by Christ to make disciples. He says, therefore, go and make disciples. This church is not a great suggestion. It is a great commission. He's commissioning us to go out and make disciples. So the question is not, you know, should I go? Should I go and tell him about Jesus? Should I help this guy or this girl to grow in the faith? That shouldn't be the question. The question is, will you obey? Will you obey this command? So one reason, we are commanded to make disciples. The second thing that I want us to look at is these stubborn facts that exist in our province. So I sit with the Gauteng Alliance, and it is a structure, just guys collaborating, um, to, collaborating in the gospel so that we could reach Gauteng. It's a great, great group of guys that I've gotten the privilege to be with. And so they've done this research, and they've looked at a couple of stubborn facts about Gauteng, about our province, about our backyard, that should make us or that should compel us to go. So I'm just going to share from one, just one uh, stubborn fact about Gauteng that should compel us to go and make disciples. So the stubborn fact is diversity, our diversity that is represented in Gauteng, it is used for disunity. So our socioeconomic and racial diversity divides us to such an extent that we cannot collaborate on a common vision. We cannot unite around a common vision. And I strongly believe that through disciple making or being in a relationship where we are journeying with people, I strongly believe that these, these bridges that we desperately need to bridge the gaps between the racial divisions, I strongly believe that making disciples answers that. It's a bold claim, but it is one that I have grown to appreciate and I have experienced that firsthand. So I was introduced to Christ by an Afrikaans man, a man from, from an Afrikaans background. He shared the gospel with me. One, that was just confusing because I wondered, why is this guy taking interest in me? Our past, our history had wired us to be different, right? To not come together. But why was this man taking interest in my life? And this man had become a believer at university. So when I stepped onto the university campus, the last thing I thought I would become was a Christian. So I encountered this guy and he started sharing the gospel with me. That blew my mind. In my continued journey in being discipled, I've had different guys come into my life and continue to disciple me. And one of them was Pastor Gerard, Gerard Fenta. And we come from different backgrounds, right? But I tell you, what used to happen in our discipleship groups, we'd have real conversations about what is happening around us. But because of our proximity to one another, those prejudices were broken down. So I believe that it is no political manifesto that will ever solve this problem. I strongly believe that it is disciples of Christ that have been commissioned by the Lord to go and make disciples that will bring hope 
and challenge the stubborn fact about our province. So our proximity to one another, I was also discipled by an American, a white American guy. And in fact, this used to be a conversation starter on campus. A lot of the guys in my res as a student, they would wonder, why are you guys always spending time with those people? Those people are different from me. But man, what an opportunity that we had on campus to say, well, these men are different. They have been with Jesus. I strongly believe that as God's church, we have an opportunity to model something different. So why should you, why should compel us to go and make disciples? We are commanded by the Lord. And there are these, there are these stubborn facts about our province. We have stubborn hearts. To this day, I'm in a discipleship experience and environment where weekly I journey with my community group. We come from different backgrounds and that helps us to journey together to have an understanding of one another. So that gap has been breached because of the gospel, because we are driven to make disciples. And the third thing that should compel us to go and make disciples, it is that it's a guaranteed mission. This mission of making disciples, it is guaranteed. So look at Matthew 24, 14. This will come up on your screen. This is what it says. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So this gospel will be preached. All the nations will be reached with the gospel. And then the end will come. So not only do we have an authoritative Lord commissioning us, commanding us, not only do we have a Lord who has promised his presence to us, but we have a very sure mission. We have a guaranteed mission that it will be accomplished. Disciple making will be accomplished. The question is, will you be a part of that? So just to end the sermon, just to land the plane, I have two questions for you. Who is investing in you? Who is leading you? Who is teaching you to obey everything that Christ has commanded you? And, whom, and to whom are you doing that? Whom are you investing in? Who is your man? Who is your woman? Who are you pointing to Christ? And a maybe final question would be, what will your epitaph read? What would it say? What would your epitaph say? What would it say about you? If you were to put down your epitaph right now, and say, this is what it, it potentially could read about my life right now. I wonder, and I want to challenge you, that your epitaph should be, he was a faithful disciple maker. He was a faithful disciple of Christ. And he discipled others. She was a faithful disciple of Christ. And she discipled others. So if the Lord stares up, anything about making disciples and you're wondering what to do with this message and you're wondering then how do I how am I supposed to make disciples I want to challenge you to reach out to me my email is zwai at rec.org.za and I'll sit down with you and we will talk about making disciples because this church has multiple opportunities that are available for us in making disciples so church, I want us to look at this Matthew 28 afresh. I want us to look at this Great Commission as we strategize, as we refocus in this half time. Let us come back. Let us put our heads together and say, we want to be doing what our coach is saying. We want to go out and make disciples. Let's do that, church. It's a clear clear commission. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you that you have sent us. What a privilege it is, Lord, 
we are just mere humans, Lord. And we know, Lord, that you use the simple. You use ordinary people to accomplish great things for your kingdom. We've seen that in your disciples. And so, God, I pray that this message would lead us to obey this commission or this command of making disciples. And God, I pray that we would walk away knowing that we are not alone, that you have promised us the presence of the Holy Spirit, the enabling of the Holy Spirit as we go and as we make disciples. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen.